Welcome to another edition of Oncology Today. This program focuses on the role of BTK inhibitors in the management of patients with mantle cell lymphoma. This is medical oncologist Dr. Neil Love. I met with Dr. Michael Wang from the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. And in addition to this interview, there's also a corresponding video program featuring Dr. Wang's slide presentation. To begin, I asked them about the issue of management of patients presenting with so-called smoldering mantle cell lymphoma, in which observation is one of the considered options. A lot of uh, hmm. uh, community doctors and ac- academic doctors, uh, they would uh, they see the patient have no symptoms at all. They would uh, choose the observation. But uh, sometimes they're not sure this is a patient to me, and <laughs> I start treatment. So the smoldering mantle cell lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma is very rare. Smoldering is even more rare, okay? So, so most likely, most the scenario is the CLL type of mantle cell lymphoma. Mantle cell lymphoma present like CLL, they're in the marrow, in the spleen, in the blood, but there's no lymph nodes, okay? And those patients even have a P53 mutation, you may not have to treat them for years. But there's no criteria when to start a therapy. Usually, the patient, all oh, the patient have significant side opinion. They are feeling bad. Basically, here's my criteria. Spleen cannot be over 20, 20 centimeters. Okay, and of course, you have to adjust the size. This is for a mid, mid-sized man. If you have a final small lady, the patient has an 18 centimeter uh, uh, spleen, but the patient is small and is already having problems, so you need to pay attention. What are the main, the spleen is, uh, is the cause and symptom. What are the main issues? Early satiety, discomfort from the spleen. And sometimes the spleen can ache. That's, you have to make sure that there's ongoing infarctions in there. You have to treat the patient early, okay? The second criteria is I do not allow the WBC to be over 30%. Uh, not a third person over WBC 30 in the lymphocytosis in the peripheral blood. I do not want us allow them over, over 30. Okay, 30,000 K, 30 K, basically 30,000. So if you allow them to go up the fatigue level, the viscosity, the PEs and the strokes, while well, ischemia is going to kick in. And the art of the treating mental cell lymphoma is to heat the, the treat the heat the lymphoma before it causes any damage or symptoms. By the time you have symptoms, that means you are already too late by three or four months, okay? Please remember that. Our art of treating mental cell lymphoma is like a good dental procedure. In the past, we have severe pain with all these procedures. Now we go there, we have no pain. The same thing, mental cell lymphoma should be treated with a discomfort-free stage rather than discomfort is already knocked in, you're already too late, okay? The other issues for the... Um, Smarly mantle cell lymphoma, I do not wait for the mantle cell lymphoma lymphadenopathy to be over 2.5 centimeters. If you reach a three or four centimeters, you you know mantle cell lymphoma also has transformation. It's like Richter's transformation from CL, like follicular lymphoma transferring large cell lymphoma. Mantle cell lymphoma is constantly transforming. They can start with a KIC less than 30%, you know, progression maybe 50%. They may not have P3 mutations in, in the progression. They may acquire P53. They may start with a classical nodular diffuse type. They may become a pleomorphic blastoid in, in the progression. You do not allow the lymph node to be too big to have that pro, uh, chance to increase. You need to hit it before it has any chance to transform. So I usually start at a two centimeter. So I, I definitely do not allow it to be 2.5. I think if you do that, some of the lymphomas in, in the body, it may, you know, you, you may lose the chance, right? So, so therefore, when I see this patient from the community, I usually start them with therapy. I convince the patient you cannot, okay? Uh, I hope uh, that answered the question, Neil. Yeah, that's very interesting. What about patients with GI involvement uh, who are asymptomatic? Do you ever see people who just have GI involvement and are asymptomatic? Uh, what do you think about observing them? I'm also curious. I, I've heard, had, heard a couple of cases of people with major GI bleeds. What kinds of complications you see with GI involvement? So GI 
sometimes you see a patient with GI, you do the scope with the random biopsies. The whole GI is positive. 30 biopsies, they are all positive mentosome form. The patient has not lost weight, no abdominal pain, no bleeding, no diarrhea. <laughs> so, 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 of course, you know, I would not, if the patient present like that, I'm not going to wait for anymore. But I occasionally have major GI bleeding, mostly from the upper GI. When the stomach is involved with the ulcers and with the duodenum, you got to treat the patient quickly. Okay, otherwise you're going to have patient ulcers, bleeding, and of course sometimes if the patient have last one lymphoma, the patient have no bleeding, do not panic. Uh, that's you can observe this patient for a while. But I choose to attack if there's too much lymphoma, if there's any symptoms or any hint of danger. It's gastric ulcer, do you know an ulcer with a lymphoma? I mean, not only menosome goes to GI, like follicular lymphoma can also go to good there. So those cases, you want it to be aggressive. Do uh, all patients with mantle cell need upper and lower endoscopy, even if they don't have any GI symptoms? In my opinion, I always do. I, I, don't, I may not do it in the beginning because, uh, you know, if you don't find the lymphoma in the beginning, if the lymph node is too big, you need to treat. And then if the lymph node is too big, the GI, uh, you know, has lymphoma, you still have to treat it. It doesn't alter. But when I confer the re remission, I absolutely need the PET scan active. Everybody agrees it. Bone marrow needs to be confirmed. I always do that. And some people, when the PET scan is negative, they don't, they don't, don't do the bone marrow. But at Amy Anderson, we use the most stringent idea uh, criteria of CR. PET negative bone marrow table and upper and lower GI EGD colonoscopy with random biopsies has to be all negative. Okay. Now, if the patient started with a negative colon down somewhere air else, I would not do the confirmation. But they have to. You know, a lot of pieces they do colonoscopy without biopsies. That does not count. I still have to confirm the CR by upper and lower with random biopsies. So let's talk about first-line therapy. I want to start out talking about younger patients. And I'm curious, outside of a clinical trial, how you were managing patients typically prior to triangle, whether that changed, and how you, you would, uh, so how you're managing them today outside of a trial. And would that change at all? If you, had, if you could do whatever you want, put aside reimbursement, would you still be doing the same thing? So... Uh so a triangle, if the patient present to me, I, I would use triangle data to use ibrutinib, rituximab, maintenance for two years instead of the transplant. So the, for the younger patients, I sometimes would uh, treat the patient uh, according to window two uh, trial uh, with ibrutinib, rituximab, uh, venoclas, uh, if they have high risks because so far my response re relapse rate is almost zero with the window two using the, the so, but uh, you know, sometimes I would explain to the patient, right? So the hibernomies that has, you know, associated with a sudden death, associated with the atrial fibrillation, I would like to use the, the e column to replace hibernomies. And I already present the data and uh, you know, 90% I can get insurance approval but sometimes in other areas, uh, this may meet uh, resistance from uh, uh, the insurance. Yeah, so basically, I, I prefer chemo-free therapies for both populations, older and young, younger. So outside of clinical trial right now, what is your, again, outside, uh, outside of a clinical trial, what's your usual approach to the older patient first line? Yeah, so... The first line we published the, in GSEO uh, from my group, we talked about ibrutinib. The response is almost 100% patient, uh, you know, stay for a long time. However, 24% of patients had atrial fibrillation. So I'm mean, no longer using that. We just presented the data in uh, Lugano. We use a color and the rituximab. Very few patients has atrial fibrillation, maybe one or two among 50, and we are using e and rituximab to treat the uh, frontline patients uh, with uh, elderly uh, patients. I'm not using VR. I'm not using, uh, you know, I'm using chemo-free therapies. 
And what do you use second line? Second line, uh, so if the patient has, um, you know, frontline therapy, had a ibertinum, I prefer to use a pertubertinum. You know, and then if the patient relapsed uh, aggressively, I would consider CAR-T. All right, let's hear about this 45-year-old woman. What happened with her? Yeah, well, this is a 45-year young lady with a relapsed mental syndrome form who was taking, who is taking a carbertinib. Three days into the treatment course, the patient developed a severe headache. She was not able to function at all and experiencing extreme nausea and vomiting on many occasions. With a dark pair of glasses, <laughs> she covering her eyes, she came to the clinic with her eyes covered by a dark pair of glasses, asking for your help. So what is the following we should do? A, stop a color immediately. B, ask if this patient has a history of a migraine. C, consider sending the patient to the ER right away. D, after the ER, consider a compre- you know, do a comprehensive workup for headache, including MRI and neurological consultation. They are all negative. After the negative workup in E, resume a clotinib and a headache recurs, switch to ibertinib. And F, all the above. So my choice is A, uh, sorry, my choice is F, all of the above. So everybody know that uh, a color burn can cause a headache. The headache usually does not last more than five days, and, uh, and it, it goes away without a dose reduction with a color burn. But when a young lady with a history of migraine comes, that could become a very bad headache, and you have to stop the acalabrum immediately. Of course, if the patient is the first severe headache, uh, no MRI down, you need to you need, you need ask the patient of migraine history. You need to, if the patient has migraine, you should send the ER immediately. You have to control the pain because the pain is intolerable, okay? It, you know, after a workup MR is negative, no seizures, you know, no, no nothing, then you resume a carbonib. And if the headache recurs, you need to switch to ibuprofenib or thanuprofenib or even pertubertinib. So basically, it's all of the bob. So, uh, you know, you hear stories about these headaches a lot, particularly with CLL. And one of the things you hear is, quote, that caffeine, first of all, that most patients are not as in kind of condition of this patient, but uh, more like, you know, more nuisance is what I've heard. But I also hear a lot of people talking about caffeine. I don't know whether that is a reality or not. Do you use that? Very frequently. Uh, you know, first of all, headaches in mental cell form is not nearly as common as CIO. But it, hmm. it's occur- if it occurs, uh, uh, the medicine I want to prescribe is a fewer set. Fewer set have caffeine in, in it. It's hmm. very, very effective. Of course, you know, the patient can drink coffee, drink tea, and uh, it may not have to take any pills, but uh, the, the coffee frequently resolve a mild headache. What's her current status? She is uh, on uh, a color burden lab, and uh, he got into a very good uh, very good PR, and with a residual bone marrow disease, I added rituximab, and after rituximab, uh, about uh, two years, uh, and uh, she's uh, on the once a day calipernib. And I said, you know, you have been on it for three or four years, and uh, I wanted to stop. She said, Dr. Wong, I don't want to stop. I want. I have no symptoms. I want to continue. I'm too young. I want. I don't want the lymphoma to come back. She's on a calipernib. Well, that is uh, really fascinating. So when you uh, restarted the calibrutinib, she didn't have headaches? Uh, she did not. Yeah. Of course, you know, she, her migraine has, the give her all kinds of migraine uh, things on the PRM basis. She know when she have a migraine attack, she would stop the drug, immediately use the uh, Imitrax and others to stop the migraine. So she has only uh, two or three migraine attacks that was much less severe than the presentation. Do you uh, think twice about using a calibrutinib in a patient with migraines? First of all, you know, melanoma is a male disease in the elderly, okay? Young lady come to your clinic is very rare. <laughs> so if I have another case like this, I would prefer zanubrutinib. 
Another question I have is, in what situations, I don't even know if you can give exactly when you can get, can you not use Ebertinib right now at all or just in the relapse setting, but in what situations are you actually using Ebertinib? For from the relapse, absolutely, I stay away from uh, Ibrutinib. And uh, in the front line, I'm trying to move away from Ibrutinib. The data may be looking so good, but the patient is no longer feeling confident about the drug. And uh, and, and there's side effects. There's occasionally very rare, but the side effects, there's severe outcomes. So that's my advice to all the people listening to this lecture and uh, try to face away as much as possible. And unfortunately, despite the data. You talked about combinations of uh, BTK and venetoclax, but what about venetoclax as a single agent and a patient who's already had a BTK inhibitor? Is that a strategy that you use? If the patient has prior albuterol with anibuterol, they were not able to tolerate it. You can switch to the collaborative, no problem. But if the patient had a BTK covalent BTK inhibitor and already, you know, resistant the response is going to be very low and it's a waste of time and money and the patient's time. And so you can consider pertubertinib in this case. Uh, in what situations right now are you using xanabrutinib? So according to the data, right, so my my second go-to is a acalabrutinib because I let the FDA approval, I know the drug, and then you bring, I know it well too, right? So sometimes the patient uh, prefer thanubertinib, and uh, so sometimes I have samples. So I think thanubertinib is a very effective drug, but it is more neutropenic uh, causing than the acalabertinib. Another uh, question I had in general about BTK inhibitors, which is ventricular arrhythmias. I mean, we're starting to hear about it in CLL, mainly with ibrutinib, may, maybe a cal, I'm not sure. What about ventricular arrhythmias with mantle cell and BTK? So, so I know that Ohio State presented uh, the ventricular arrhythmias with a calibrative. Neil, I, I led the trial for a calibrative in mantle cell lymphoma, and I used it very often, almost daily. So in the past, two, since the approval of 2017 to now, this, these six years, zero ventricular rate uh, arrhythmias from my experience, of course, in mantle cell lymphoma. So second case, a 68-year-old gentleman who originally came from Santiago, Chile, now residing in Houston, came to the clinic with a suspected CLL or lymphoma. The patient's CT scan showed a spleen of 25 centimeters. However, there were no enlarged lymph nodes on the scan. Bone marrow biopsy showed mantle lymphoma. He was positive for CD20 and cyclone D1. Soxy levy was negative for this patient. WBC is a 300,000. So regular, we have 10,000, okay? So, so with 95% being lymphocytes. So what a therapeutic choice would you choose? A, leukophoresis thing, ibertinib and acalabertinib or pertubertinib. B, leukophoresis followed by rituximab followed by minamustin. C, leukophoresis followed by RTOP. D, chest CT with an angiogram to re- rule out the PE following by rituximab. E, leukophoresis, CT angiogram to rule out the PE, and meet to the hospital for rituximab with a flat rate of 25 ml. When WBC is less than 50, then ibertinib uh, or other BDK inhibitors. You know, oftentimes we observe the patient uh, with a COL type, the spleen is less than 20 centimeters, their WBC may be 20, and um, rest assured that uh, most of this patient will present someday to you with this scenario. I already s- told you in the lecture that I would use a cutoff of 30,000 uh, lymphocytosis. But uh, sometimes uh, the patient have no symptoms, uh, the community doctor would observe, even with a WBC of 100,000. <laughs> okay, so that, now this case is a, is a came from the community. This case was he was never seeing me. No, I first saw him 30k, okay, and he was fine. He was functioning fine, but uh, I did uh, like a, a PE uh, protocol, CT scan, angio. He has a saddle PE, okay, 
he probably had this PE for a few years because he's a he's accustomed to it. Okay, and he was short of breath, but he didn't even realize he was a respiration twenty to twenty five. He become his normal routine for several years, right? So we leucophorized him. This case, you absolutely cannot give him any BDK inhibitor so you can kill the patient. Why? Remember, most BDK inhibitors, including the, the pertubertinib, they cause compartment shift phenomena. 70 to 80 times percent with CIL and 30 to 40 times in with MCL. So if you give them more, he's going to have a stroke. He's going to have a, a bleeding in the eye you know, more PE, and please don't do that, okay? It's, you need to leucophoresis sometimes more than three times to reduce the WBC to a safe level, okay? Now, if you give them rituximab regular dose, again, you can have an anaphylaxis reaction because, you know, the CLL, you, a lot of people don't care, but they give the rituximab in the other patient because remember, CD20 in CLL is much lower at least 50% lower than mantosone lymphoma. Mantosone lymphoma is full of CD20. You give them, they will have overwhelming necrotic, you know, not only the tumor lysis, but sometimes the reaction is so fast that you don't have, the, you don't have see the rapid of the patient already passed out, okay? So you need to freeze them to 60, ideally give them some chemotherapy followed by slow rate of rituxan in the hospital, okay? Flat rate of 25 ml per hour, and sometimes I have reduced to 12.5 per hour. And the patient, if the patient has any, any heart problem, you have to monitor them for telemetry. Please remember, even the rituximab we use every day can be very dangerous in these scenarios. So in this patient, the right quickly leukophoresis, CT we rule out PE, admit to the hospital, slow rituximab 25 per hour without escalation, and in, in, then... Maybe after that, you can consider a, a, a BDK inhibitor, okay? What's the so, current status of this patient? Oh, the patient's <laughs> so alive and well. <laughs> after, after he stays in long-term remission, uh, he, is, he, he has not even received the chemotherapy. Uh, he has been uh, ibrutinib, and recently I switched him to uh, acalabrutinib due to the withdrawal. The 71-year-old gentleman with a history of mental lymphoma presented himself to my clinic for continue or your clinic for continuation of therapies for relapsed mental lymphoma. She was previously treated with R2 or lenalidomide rituximab, I should say, benamustine rituximab, and ibrutinib. He further relapsed a tumor of three centimeters near the mediastinum and other enlarged lymphadenopathies throughout the body, but less than three centimeters. KIC7 is 10% with uh, the uh, molecular variant, uh, sorry, the morphology variant was nodular. You know, everybody know that the nodular diffuse pleomorphic and blastoid, nodular being the least aggressive is indolent. So what is your next therapy? Ecolibrinib? or induction with the chemotherapy followed by stem cell transplant, or chemotherapy with a hyper-CVAD, protoburinib, or a range of CAR T cell therapy. First of all, the patient uh, is, has no significant symptoms, and his relapse is very indolent. The three centimeters lymph node is not buggy at all, and a key I7, anything over 30 is uh, aggressive, but he's only 10%. Okay, and the nodular variant. So small, small bucket, non bucket disease relapse with the indolent features. Do you justify for 71 years to go to CAR T cell? Absolutely not. This case, of course, you according to the criteria, he meets the criteria for CAR T cell. But remember, this person, if you give the pertubertinib, it can last for a long time. I have a patient on pertubertinib for five, six years now. So. Ecolibrinib, you cannot use it because the patient is already resistant to abertinib. Induction with chemo, for, remember, relapse setting, you never, never use autologous stem cell transient mantosone, relapse mantosone, never. The autologous stem cell transient is only applied for frontline therapy that has been challenged by the triangle study, okay? Chemotherapy with the hyper absolutely not. We are in the 
chemo free time, we don't use this high. This the patient has a small tumor, a single peel can put him in remission for years. Why use a hyper CVAT? So, per the would it, would it be the answer? So, so what this happened? patient, a lot of patients would use CAR T cells. I would argue, please don't. This is a very small tumor, and it, maybe per by him three years, we have a non less toxic CAR T in the elderly patient, but don't, don't do this. <laughs> so that's my opinion. What happened with this patient? Oh, the patient uh, is on per on the clinical trial <laughs> for about uh, uh, three years now and uh, has no need for, you know, still in good remission and I'm very happy. And uh, I think he was the patient advocate uh, was speaking on his experience uh, with the per so uh, no tolerability issues with him? He said, Dr. Wong, could you give me a placebo? I said, no, this file has no placebo. <laughs> this is a single arm file. <laughs> what has been your experience uh, with CAR-T, and how do you uh, evaluate patients, particularly older patients or patients with, with uh, comorbidities uh, in terms of CAR-T? First of all, when the lymphoma relapsed for three times and the key axis stem is over 50%, and uh, all the patient have a big tumor, all the patient uh, has blood toilet polymorphic, all the patient have P53 mutation, you need to move to the CAR T cell as soon as possible. You need to find ways to control the tumor volume to reduce the tumor as low as possible, followed by CAR T. And uh, you, you, you cannot delay CAR-T because uh, all the therapies only last for a few months and, and, and you, the patient will get a physical condition, will get worse and worse, and you will have a much worse condition when you, when you delay the CAR-T. So, however, you know, what if the patient has a history of atrial fibrillation? That's very tough. You may want to know to bleed that atrial fibrillation. I do that all the time. So my good friend, Dr. Kuckendorfer, who came up with the, the uh, technology which licensed to kite, he and I agreed that uh, if the patient has atrial fibrillation, no, no ablation, he's not good to CAR-T because uh, the, the arrhythmia rate is just too high. When the patient has fever, CRS, the atrial fibrillation is going to come out. So number one, the cardiac issue is always a tough issue, and you want to use the most definitive therapy to address that. And the second issue is the patient um, has kidney problems. So, so I never had too much problem with the kidney problem if the patient have the creatinine too. I, I, I never had any bad experience with the CAR T cells. Okay. The next issue is that uh, the CAR T with the CAR T therapy used to be the CRS and, uh, and the neurotoxicity we dread of, we are scared of it. But now we have dramatically improved our management with the tocilizumab, you know, with the different uh, drugs where okay, the neurotoxicity is no longer that feared. But now, now the number one killer of CAR-T patients is no longer CRS or neurotoxicity. It is a long-term infections. Post-CAR-T, please measure IV, IG. If the IgG is low, you absolutely need the IVIG, okay? You need to start with monthly and gradually every other two months on that. Otherwise, the patient has died from neutropenic fever. They have died from fungal infections, histoplasmosis, JC virus, you name it. In the past, we, we said, oh, we look for the common things. So we, we just keep the zebras. Now, these days, the zebras are becoming common pathogens because our therapy, we think about it, the B cell, right? and T cell, the B cell, we, we have treated with three prior therapies, all containing rituximab, okay? We, our chemotherapy has damaged the patient's immune system, T cell and B cell. And then CAR T will con cause constantly B cell aplasia. <laughs> this is a setup for, for infection, right? The infection, especially pneumonia, is a killer. So you have sinusitis, you better kill the sinusitis because if you don't control the sinusitis early, you will become pneumonia. So this is the skills that you need to, to, to acquire that we, for the patient post-CAR-T, you do not allow any infection to be linked on. Chronic UTI, culture it, kill it. Sinus problems, you have this recent, the nevages, the apparatus, you have to watch the sinus. 
You send the patient to the ENT if there's an abnormal structural problem, you fix it. Kind of curious, uh, what's the oldest patient you sent for CAR-T with mantle cell? Uh, it was the uh, patient uh, was uh, around uh, 85, and uh, he survived. He's still, he's still alive. <laughs> what about bispecifics in mantle cell? I think that that's the future. Uh, I think, you know, CAR-T cell therapies... Uh, is laborious and uh, also um, they use other T cells a lot. So even after CAR T cell therapy failure, some of the the bisphenol antibody can still rescue many patients with a mental follicular lymphoma. And I'm sure if we do it in the in mental, that I have, you know I have to study the combination of uh, polatuzumab plus uh, mosantuzumab, CAR T cell patient rescued, hundred percent response. You know, I've used uh, uh, epicurin. So those uh, data, I'm one of the first abstract I will be showing the ASH. But biospecific works even after CAR T failures. So we need to probably, uh, you know, CAR T cell therapy hard to combine, but the biospecific antibody can be combined with a novel target agent. So it can even move to the front line. In the front line, you may need only a target agent or rituximab plus a biospecific antibody. You don't need anything. So Bicycling antibodies, tricycling antibodies, tricycling antibodies also coming, T cell engagers, is, that's the big part of the mental cell and pharma therapy future. What about enhancing CAR T? I saw you uh, did a paper with Tidget plus CAR T. What are some of the <laughs> other strategies that are being looked at to try to improve the outcomes? So first of all, how to improve the CAR-T? We first are moving the CAR-T to the front line because in the front line, the patient has not received any therapy and the immune system is intact. So, so, so we are, have a window three trial with a, a color burn of, uh, as an induction followed by CAR-T. And so the other ways is like you said, is a per, you know, for example, we are using, uh, uh, there's trials, not with us, but there's trials with a BDK inhibitor, ibrutinib combined with a CAR-T. Uh, I don't know the result. I know the trial is ongoing. And we are, we are you know, there's also some other centers are doing pertinent to combine with CAR-T, uh, pertinent the induction therapy during and especially the maintenance. Remember, the CAR-T therapy, if their response rate is only 80%, you use pertinent, it's going to drive to almost 100%. And then it's such a non-toxic drug, and the maintenance will, you know, dramatically improve the uh, the duration. So CAR T cell can be bound, combined with the target therapies. That's another uh, area of intensive studies. We are curing the mental cell lymphoma. I've been at MNR for more than twenty years, so a lot of my patients have been in remission for twenty years. So I know it can be cured. When you say curing it, are you referring more to CAR T or also BTK, venetoclax? CR rating twenty years is my definition for mental cell lymphoma cure. A lot of people think that pa- ten years for large cell lymphoma, thirty years for follicular lymphoma, for mental cell lymphoma. You know, there's no data. I talk to all my colleagues; every agree would agree twenty years CR. <laughs> I'm curious. So, where what the plateau is in CAR T therapy and mantle cell? how it compares to the plateau with diffuse large B cell? Unfortunately, there's no plateau in, in mantle cell lymphoma. So the curve still have relapses. And so I did the led the Zuma 2 study. I have maybe five patients after seven years, they're still in remission. Instead of having 40% of flat rate of large cell lymphoma, mantle, remember, mantle cell lymphoma is relapsing, right? So remember, you can use our, our cell lymphoma aggressive, but our trouble can cure 60% of the people. You use our trouble for mantle cell lymphoma, there's no cure, right? So mantle cell lymphoma, the curve is still not flat. Unfortunately, that's the nature of the beast. So we are we have more challenges uh, to cure mantle cell than large cell lymphoma. To be honest with you, you know, and uh, large cell lymphoma, it's amazing. They're 39 percent, uh, five years still 39 percent. Not with the mantle cell lymphoma, my friend. Have you used bispecifics after CAR T and seen any benefit? Yeah, and uh, in, yeah, I used it uh, in trials, and uh, I'm going to present uh, some good data in at ASH. Anything else you're presenting at ASH that you want to comment on? 
So I'm going to present uh, the uh, combination of Apollo Tuzumab, Mos and Tuzumab at ASH. Uh, uh, so I, I'm going to present uh, some data with a new CAR T cell. You know, uh, uh, Braxel carbartogen uh, is proved by FDA. There's a new CAR T cell called the Lysol cell in Madison and Pharma. I presented the primary data in Lugano uh, a month ago, but uh, we have a different uh, subgroup analysis of pr to bring that ash, and that will be something new to Madison and Pharma. So a lot of exciting things, Neil. Globally, how does that data look like uh, compared to Brexy? There's a uh, severe differences between the product. Uh, the efficacy is lower. The durability is lower, but the, the, the toxicity is much, much improved. I saw an interesting paper. I don't know if it's going anywhere, but I was just kind of curious on a bemaciclib and copanlisib. CDK seems to be popping up in places I don't expect. I've seen it in prostate cancer. Is there any uh, evidence that CDK is useful in mantle cell? First of all, CDK four or six inhibitors uh, because the CD four or six is one is heavily involved in the pathogenesis of melanoma and pharma. So ideally, you would try, but uh, all the CDK four or six inhibitors uh, orally have a response rate of, of a single agent about thirty percent. So, you know, thirty percent for other tumors like breast cancer are huge. For melanoma and pharma, sorry, it's too the response is too low. <laughs> hmm. That's, that's so, interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, you mentioned um, earlier in your talk um, another BTK inhibitor, Orella Brut Britanib, I think yes. it was. Yeah. What's What do we know about that? Uh, is that an agent that may uh, come into practice? Yeah, there's a promising data in, uh, in China. This is a Chinese drug. And I know... It is very effective, uh, and the uh, response rate is like near 90%. Uh, it's a very good commanded BDK inhibitor, and that may be, they are aiming for, there's a trial, ongoing pivotal trial for to get a US FDA approval. Interesting. I'm kind of curious, you know, mantle cells are not that common. Are there any, but you still hear about advocacy groups out there, very rare diseases. Are there any advocacy groups focusing on mantle cell? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people, uh, you know, we know that there's a community on mantle cell lymphoma, a community. So people exchange ideas. Although it's, you hear about 4,000 people in the U.S. only. Uh, but, it, you know, these people are living more than 20 years, so, so you could imagine the number prevalence is big. And then you think about uh, you, the Europeans that even have a little higher response incidence than the U.S. And the China, the Asian countries, are less Manasone found, but their sheer number of population. So Manasone found across the whole world is a big health issue. And uh, so, uh, you know, that's why there's uh, such a, a big market, uh, you know, overall, uh, the whole world globally. Any other research avenues that we haven't talked about in mantle cell that you think may have promise for the future? Well, first of all, we, you know, we do not have the luxury of large cell lymphoma. They have more people, more funding, more people, just more like 10, 20 times more researchers working on large cell lymphoma. So mantle cell lymphoma translation study need to catch up. So uh, I know, uh, you know, there's only like a, only a few places that only do mantle research. So my, my lab is, is catching up with a lot of sample processing. Uh, we are, you know, st studying the burden resistance, I burden resistance, CAR T resistance. And uh, we, we are trying to find new target, uh, Neil, to, uh, for, for mantle and pharma therapy. You mentioned uh, transform mantle cell, and I have to admit, I've never heard that until you brought it up. Um, what can you talk a little bit about? You know, is it like that you, you referred to, you know, what you see with uh, CLL and FL also? Uh, mm -hmm. How treatable or untreatable it, is it? Does it respond to CAR T or uh, diffuse large B cell therapies? There's a transformation in many layers. Uh, so we don't have a morphologic, uh, like a Richter's large cell lymphoma, that is dramatic, but uh, the, the, once the mantle cell lymphoma initially always indolent, and then the key ICCM, P53, 
eventually it will become blastoid. It's better for now. We have so many therapies, we keep prolonging them. They would uh, transfer into a very blastoid lymphoma. You do, it looks like large cell lymphoma is still called mental cell lymphoma due to the markers. And, um, you know, we recently uh, are gathering some cases uh, of mental cell lymphoma when they are terminal stage, uh, they went to, uh, they involved to the skin. And you move the once the lymphoma in the manosome in the skin, the key I see them in near hundred percent. They stop responding to anything. Maybe radiation, even CAR T would not work. So this patient, uh, and then sometimes it's in different organs, in the brain, in the lung, in the in the you know when the manosome in terminal stages, it behaves like a large cell lymphoma, even Burkitt's lymphoma. No therapy would work, and this is our challenge. We need to. Do I specifically, we need to combine two, uh, we need to all the combination to save these people. And radiation is the main tool uh, in, in those cases. You mentioned blastoid. When you see that, does that change the way you approach these patients and any other oh, high risk, yeah. any other high risk yeah. variants that change what you do? Anytime the patient has a blastoid or pleomorphic, any one of them, P53 mutation or deletion, you know, and a uh, polymorphic, a key I see over 50%, complex karyotype, big bucky tumor, you immediately become very aggressive. Sometimes you have to use chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is not used as often, but a chemotherapy is the irreplaceable tool that we use to treat any disease, oncology. So don't forget chemotherapy. They can quickly put the patient in remission and rescue the patient from symptoms. Then you can use target therapy for maintenance. So, so when I see a big tumor, large blastoids, I the patient have not received chemotherapy. I immediately my go-to regimen is uh, this morning. I have a conversation with Dr. Stephen Schuster from UPenn, and we discuss the case. He has the patient progress with all kind of things. So chemotherapy, my go-to therapy is cytoxan, dexamethasone, fractional cytodexamethasone with rituximab and with concurrent radiation, low dose, okay? You only do two fractions uh, and they, the tumor will crash. So I, I think a lot of people are using it and they tell me that, Michael, it really works. This concludes our program. Special thanks to Dr. Wang and thank you for listening. This is Dr. Neil Love for Oncology Today.